morning, good day. We're about to start. Please get seated. Sorry for the slight delay, traffic, the weather, tech glitches, everything. <laughs> so thank you very much to everyone who is with, with us here today in person, but also those joining us from around the world here in the US in Ghana, in Nigeria, in other parts of um, Africa. Uh, my name is Zainab Osman. I am the director of the Africa program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace here in Washington, DC. We are really delighted to be hosting this very important conversation today on Africa's post-pandemic economic recovery. And we're doing this in partnership with the One Campaign. At the Carnegie Endowment's Africa program, we focus on the economic, the political, and the transnational issues that are shaping the African continent today, but that will also have relevance for the continent's future. And a key objective of our work is really to help shape global discourse and policy on Africa towards outcomes that foster uh, prosperity and stability on the continent. And one way we aim to achieve this objective is really by facilitating meaningful dialogue between African stakeholders, be they policy makers or scholars or thought leaders and their counterparts here in the United States and also in global capitals. Uh, as we know, the African continent has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, mainly through economic impacts, which have been quite severe for parts of the continent. Uh, this shock has exacerbated existing fiscal and socioeconomic challenges. And African countries, however, are recovering, as we know. Uh, according to the World Bank, in a recently published um, macroeconomic update, Sub-Saharan Africa is actually projected to grow this year by around 3.6% in aggregate. The pace of this recovery however, is constrained by low rates of vaccination, uh, tight fiscal space for many governments, uh, unequal access to external finance, and increasing debt vulnerabilities in quite a number of countries. Now we also have the war in Ukraine, Russia's invasion, its weaponization of commodities, and the consequent economic and financial sanctions have disrupted global trade flows and commodity markets. These disruptions are certainly adding a lot more pressure to African countries. Still, African governments have undertaken a wide range of initiatives to provide relief to their citizens and to position their economies on a path of economic resilience and uh, prosperity. We have seen a number of tax and fiscal reforms and social protection initiatives. And today we will hear from the honorable ministers of, um, and ministers of finance of Ghana and of uh, Nigeria on that front. In addition to these national initiatives, there have been global responses as well. These include the common framework for debt treatments with the G20, the allocation of special drawing rights uh, by the IMF, which was done last year, and in fact, just a few days ago, we know the IMF endorsed the creation of the Resilience and Sustainability Trust as a new mechanism to recycle the special issuance of special, of, um, special drawing rights of uh, August 2021. And indeed, regional organizations such as UNECA and non-governmental organizations such as the One Campaign, uh, partners for this event today, have been at the forefront of advocacies for these global responses. I am delighted to announce that we have the heads of these two organizations today, both UNECA and uh, the One Campaign. And there's still a lot of scope for more US engagement with African countries in their path towards a resilient economic recovery, including the expansion of trade. So we have with us here today the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the US Department of Commerce. This discussion, I think, maybe I'm biased, promises to be insightful as it is important. But before we begin, let me quickly go over some housekeeping rules. 
what we'll do is we'll have a sit down conversation, starting with the honorable ministers, and then hearing the US and uh, the, the global perspective on uh, Africa's uh, post-pandemic economic recovery. Uh, and then we'll have time for uh, a question and answer session. It's gonna be very brief, but we'll try to make that work. Um, so now to begin, I would like to introduce Dr. Vera Songwe. She is a United Nations Under Secretary General and the Executive Secretary of UNECA, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, I invite you to read her bio online. Welcome, Dr. Songwe. Good morning, um, Honorable Ministers of Finance of Nigeria and Ghana, Gail, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, to Trade. Good morning as well. Um, colleagues, friends, uh, members of the development community, thank you. I think it's a, a, a pleasure, first of all, to be here um, uh, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, working with Gail. Good to see you again. Uh, my sister, we have been together uh, for two years, two and a half years now, uh, almost one would think in the same room, even though not in the same room, but just uh, spending many, many nights uh, as COVID began, talking about what to do and what not to do uh, uh, on Zooms. We discovered Zooms and, and uh, Minister Ken, Minister Zainab, I think we've all sort of gotten uh, 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 an increased familiarity, but also a, a, a resilience and a resoluteness to fight this fight and, and come out on the other side winning. The fact that we are here today probably means that we are on our way to it, but we're not there yet. And why are we not there? I think what we have seen is clearly um, an Africa that, yes, is resilient, has been resilient. We all know that when the COVID 19 pandemic started, the Economic Commission for Africa was one of the first that did an assessment of the impact of COVID-19 on African economies. At the time, we all believed that uh, what was going to happen was contraction because of health, uh, uh, because of the pandemic itself. Clearly, the pandemic did not hit Africa as we would have expected. 840 uh, million people got COVID, and uh, Africa only had about at least reported figures somewhere in the order of 8 million uh, of that overall number. And, and we see clearly that uh, there was a huge disparity. But where Africa got severely hit was on the economics. Um, at the time, I think we woke up one morning and oil prices were at zero. <laughs> we didn't know what to do. Oil prices are now going to 20, 123. But at the time, that's, that's the economy that the continent was facing, uh, remittances contracting, um, when you look backwards, two of our airlines have gone under. One of uh, the airlines, I think oh, people would say, if you're prepared, you can fight a crisis. I think everybody will agree that Mauritius was one of the more prepared countries on the continent before the crisis, but Air Mauritius no longer exists. So as Air Seychelles. So, so this didn't only hit countries that were not uh, macroeconomically robust, or, uh, uh, but also those that we had been citing before the crisis as being uh, stewards of good macroeconomic uh, leadership. Of course, uh, part of the big conversation around the crisis, and you would have heard a lot about it, was immediately the reaction, and we worked together on that a lot, was from the African economy saying, you know, we need um, some kind of stay of, uh, uh, for our payment of interest, uh, particularly because what has happened towards uh, the the, the, the end of the 2000s was African countries going to the markets, as we all know. Uh, in the 1990s, in the early 2000s, we only had about two African countries that had access to markets. But by 2020, we had 25 African countries that, were, that had access to markets. I tend to say that uh, the reason why uh, many of the African countries were beginning to have access to markets was precisely because they had put in place the macroeconomic reforms that were needed to be able to attract the private sector to come and invest in on the continent, but also that there was opportunity on the continent for more investment, for better investment, as 
uh, African economies were beginning to manage their macroeconomics well. But we were clearly not, uh, when the crisis struck, in the heydays of sort of the early 2000s where we were growing at 8, 9, 10% growth on the continent had already fallen substantially. We were at 3.7, 3.8%, which is nothing to write home about if population growth is 2.5. So we were already struggling. And, and so when the crisis hit, of course, uh, we got the worst recession that the continent has had in 25 years. And essentially, the first uh, order of business for many economies was to see how you put a cushion or you put a floor under this crisis so that particularly the poor don't fall further into poverty. We estimate that with the COVID crisis, about 100 million people fell into poverty. But we have just done some analysis that also shows that for many countries that we believed had already won the poverty fight, which is essentially saying that they were below 20, 15 percent uh, of their population below the poverty line, we saw countries where the vulnerability or the vulnerable population was 40 percent. So even though there were not the, the percentage of the population below the poverty line was low, the population that was in the vulnerable cat category was quite high. And as we all say, Africa has a huge informal sector, which essentially means that uh, informality means you're not identified. We don't know who you are. So if you're receiving any kind of social uh, uh, protection, you, the government knows where you are. If you're receiving some kind of humanitarian assistance, the humanitarian space knows where you are. If you're informal, nobody knows you exist. So when there is a crisis, those are the people that get left behind because nobody knows where to find them to target them with any kind of assistance. This is the population that essentially suffered the most uh, from the COVID uh, crisis. Of course, the three things that then uh, uh, we, we, we came together with the ministers of finance again to ask for where one immediate uh, stay in all of the uh, interest payments. So we got the debt service suspension initiative. Um, to date, it has brought in about, or at least uh, uh, stayed of $10.3 billion of uh, interest payments uh, that uh, the, the continent asked, uh, which, is going to, which is coming due in June, actually, which is one of the reasons why, and I'll come to that in two minutes, a couple of things that we are asking for. Um, the next one was we asked for uh, special drawing rights. Uh, and I'll come back a little bit to the experience of asking for special drawing rights and what we may begin to think of doing uh, differently. Of course, for the uh, poorest uh, of the poor, we asked for debt relief, which the IMF uh, also uh, offered to, to many countries. But the combination of the contractions in supply chains, the drops in demand, the fall in prices, the increases in, in, in s food scarcity at the time before uh, uh, the Ukraine crisis, all that uh, clearly led to a continent that was already under stress, drops in, our in, in growth, of course, as I, I, I have already said. So as we know, um, liquidity was injected into the global economy, liquidity to the order of about $23 trillion. On average, 11,500 GDP per capita was given to a developed country economy. So each person in the developed world got about 11,500 because of the crisis to spend. Uh, in uh, emerging market economies, they got about $127. In low-income countries, $52. So this is just a little bit the distribution of the support that went to populations and people as a result of the crisis. So clearly, we begin to get what I call dynamic divergence. The economies of the world start diverging in different directions. The United States, as we saw, uh, uh, restored growth. Uh, China as well started growing. Europe, of course, started growing. But because of the huge injection of liquidity in the United States, we hit uh, an inflation problem. And the minute you hit an inflation problem and there is a decision to start tapering, what ends up happening is that inflation gets transported back into the low-income countries that are importing uh, food and other commodities from the developed world. So even though we didn't get the liquidity to fight the crisis, we got the pain of having overfought the crisis. And by the way, as I say, in 2008, we didn't put enough liquidity into the system globally. So the sort of coming out of the crisis took much longer. So in 2020, we did the right thing, which was to say immediately let's inject some liquidity. But we injected a little bit too much and a little bit to only a very small group of people, not to enough of the population. So we spoke about the SDRs. We started asking for SDRs in March 2020. 
we got SDRs 253 days later. So if you're just thinking about, you know, can I actually use those SDRs, it came a little bit too late. And for Africa, we got $33.6 billion from 650 billion, that's about 5.1%. But actually the top five countries on the continent got 31% of that. So essentially the rest of the countries really got next to nothing. And so this is the crisis that we were coming out of just before we hit the Ukraine crisis. The Ukraine crisis, of course, has now given us the f what we call the four Fs, food, fuel, fertilizer, and finance. And so again, another crisis that the, the, the economies are dealing with. One of the things that we're uh, hoping that we will get now is quick action, so speed. We now learned that we took too long to respond the last time around, so quick action. Second, quick liquidity. We can reissue SDRs, we can reissue them in a different way, in a more equitable way, so that those who need it most. So while the West is tapering, we can clearly continue to provide more liquidity. So we're calling for an issuance, a new issuance of SDRs. And finally, the African continent has what we call the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which means more trade. But what we are seeing is a lot of economies are shutting down their borders, they're slapping export bans on a number of trade uh, commodities, and we're calling for an opening of that to ensure that with the CFTA we can regrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Songwei, for that opening and really reminding us of what the asks are to the international community with respect to supporting African countries to recover and build resilience uh, for their economies. Um, so now I would like to um, invite uh, our uh, distinguished guests. I mean, we have a number of distinguished guests, but our honorable uh, ministers uh, uh, from uh, uh, Ghana uh, and also from Nigeria. So we have uh, uh, honorable minister Zainab Shamsuna Ahmed, Nigeria's uh, minister of finance, budget and planning. <laughs> Please join us on the stage. And we have our Honorable Minister Kenneth Ofori Atta, Ghana's Minister of Finance and Economic Planning. They have uh, very illustrious biographies. Uh, I invite you to please uh, uh, see our website for those biographies. Um, thank you. on. Um, <laughs> you know, with uh, COVID-19, we're still kind of coming back to doing events in person, and even the technology sometimes misbehaves. So I want to begin by asking a, a very broad question. Um, Africa's recovery from COVID-19 and, of course, other shocks, including the war in Ukraine will require significant financing that a lot of countries, actually not just in Africa, but around the world, the financing that they just don't have. In Nigeria and Ghana, revenue shortfalls and mounting debt servicing costs, maybe not the stock of debt, but debt servicing in particular, are putting a lot of pressure on your respective governments. So. My question to begin with is, what impacts have these external shocks have, 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 what impacts have they had for your economies and for the plans that you had initially set out with respect to fiscal policy, with respect to development policy more broadly? Maybe I'll start with the minister from Nigeria. Thank you very much, uh, Zainab. Let me thank the Carnegie Foundation as and as well as one campaign for organizing also respects to Camilla and Vera and of course my, my brother uh, Ken and to all the distinguished guests that are here today. COVID-19, so I'll say it's nice to be out here in person meeting. I felt at some point that I was living in a Zoom world. It's good to be back in the real world. COVID-19 and the war 
in Ukraine, two challenges affected the whole world, but it also affected our, us as individual countries in, in a different way. While for Nigeria, the health impact and for most of Africa was very minimal, the economic impact was very significant. Uh, how did that happen? Because of the slowdown in trade, the shutdown, uh, lockdown in many economies that cut supply chains, and also the lockdown that we have had to impose locally. And in the case of Nigeria, we were also hit because around the same time there was this uh, challenge within the OPEC circle that also brought down the price of crude oil, which is a major uh, foreign exchange and of our country very, very significantly. So we're facing twin challenges of COVID-19 as well as the crash in the crude oil price. What did we do? We had to very quickly take a number of measures. First of all, to address the health crisis, we put in place a tax force that was daily tracking what was happening and educating the people. And also, we put in place an economic sustainability plan that was costed at about uh, about 5.9 billion US dollars that enabled us to very quickly upgrade healthcare centers across the country to enable, enhance our response to the pandemic. And these are local resources that we started out with before support came from the international community. First of all, from the IMF through the RFI facility and subsequently from the World Bank and the African Development Bank in the form of loans. But it, it helped us also to see the weaknesses that we had in the health sector and the opportunities that the uh, uh, pandemic also provided because we saw new industries grew from the crisis itself. Of course, the, the obvious ones are the, uh, the testing centers. So there were labs that were running mega businesses because of the tests, but also people uh, producing masks, protective clothing, factories. So there was an economy also around the COVID-19. And the economic sustainability plan we provided enabled us to uh, protect micro, small, medium enterprises so that they're able to retain jobs so jobs are not lost. We provided funding in different aspects and different to different groups to enable people just stabilize and, and not uh, uh, further impoverish people. But we also saw an escalation of in our case, the urban poor. So the increase in vulnerability was more obvious in the urban centers rather than the rural centers. Because the rural centers, they were just doing their basic thing. They were, do, they were still farming. They didn't lock down. The cities had people that depended on going out on a daily basis to earn a living. So people were greatly impacted. So we had to do special support for, for those uh, uh, group of people as well. What did this mean? It means we had to repurpose our budgets to reprioritize spending to the health sector to address the vulnerable and the poor, as well as also to uh, prop up the economy. But despite all that, the Nigerian economy still went into recession in the third quarter of 2020, but it was the shortest, one of the shortest recessions in, in history. Um, we, we exited recession very quickly in the fourth quarter of 2020. And since then, the economy has been on the path of consistent growth, five quarters of consistent growth. And we're expecting also 2022 to close in a positive uh, 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 trajectory. But just as we were stabilizing and things were looking better, we now had, for Nigeria, first of all, we we had passed the petroleum industry bill that made a clear provision that we needed to exit fuel subsidies because fuel subsidy was a major cost in the economy. And this was planned to have been effected in July. We had a public, a lot of public concern. And as a result of the concern, People were complaining that there was still vulnerability. Things were still difficult. Don't pull the surprise now. So, and of course, it was also political season. We have elections coming up in, <laughs> in May 2023. So we have to step back. To, okay, instead of pulling our budget, we'll extend it to 12 months or maybe to 18 months. And we went back to parliament to get such an approval. But it meant, in our own case, another significant deficit 
on the budget, which was not planned for, which was not included in our median time framework and in the budget. So just as we were planning to adjust the budgets and had actually gone to the parliament with such a request, the war on Ukraine started and uh, it worsened our situation. Why? Because Nigeria is an oil producing country. We are also not refining uh, refined petroleum products. So we have to import uh, products. And it meant that as the crude oil prices rise, it's costing us more to import this product. So we are not getting the benefits. Uh, people were asking me, you must be smiling all the way to the bank with the high prices. No, it widened our deficit. So we have a deficit now that is uh, about 4.5% uh, of our GDP. And we started with a deficit of under under 3.5%. Uh, so it moved about 1%, uh, added 1% uh, deficit to uh, our GDP. So we do hope that this crisis is contained very quickly. If this whole global committee does anything, yeah. and uh, if we want to address and stabilize the global economy, is actually to stop the w Ukraine war. Whatever we need to do as a collective to stop this war and to move the sanctions that will be good for the global economy, not just for the Nigerian economy, but it will be good for the global economy. I'd like to stop here at this time, Zena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Very uh, pertinent points there. Uh, I like the fact that you um, uh, mentioned the issue of subsidies. I was going to come to that. You covered it. Uh, I might still circle back on it. But also, I think your conclusion that the important thing right now is to find a way to stop this war because it's a war that is having really important and devastating spillover impacts for not just Europe, but clearly African countries and other parts of the world. Very, very important message there. Now I would like to turn over to um, uh, Honorable Minister Ken Oforiata. Um, of course, Africa is not a country even though Nigeria and Ghana are neighbors, uh, the, the dynamics are very, very different. Uh, what have been the impacts for Ghana of these external shocks? Thank you very much, um, Yeltsin. Um, yeah, the difference is that we qualified for the World Cup. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Zain of that. That's good. <laughs> I'm going to need oil from here, so. I better be careful. No, but it's it's been. I, I think Zainab said it. Zainab, you you had. Um, I think it was a quotation that no one teaches a finance minister um, how to navigate a global pandemic. Was what you said once in one of our Zoom meetings, and it was just trust learning to be able to <coughs> contain you know these exogenous issues. So Ghana had been growing at about, you know, 7% since 2017. And then suddenly we had uh, about a 25 uh, billion uh, in terms of revenues coming down by about 12 billion and expenditures up by about 14 billion. Uh, and suddenly a deficit of um, um, f under 5% uh, had moved to uh, 11.4%, etc. Um, and our growth rate had plummeted to 0.4%. Um, so that really was a, the situation we were in. And then our president was also very clear in one of his statements. We know how to bring back an econ our economy back to life, but we do not know how to bring people back to life. Um, which really was telling the finance minister to do everything you can to make sure that um, you protect um, your people. Um, so that led to um, a destabilization of the macro is that, that we had. Um, but uh, strangely uh, enough, by 2021, uh, just got the numbers, we actually were able to grow from the 0.4% to 
and 5.4% um, GDP had expanded and um, our projected um, um, fiscal deficit of 9.2 um, was now being managed you know, a lot better than that. But it really brought just added pressures um, with resources that uh, we, did, we did not have. Uh, and then, of course, um, you have the whole issue of the war coming and changing everything. But in between that then was the issue of um, the downgradings that Africa uh, was meted on Africa. And we ourselves got downgraded. Um, and the consequence of that leads to shutting you out of the international capital markets. Um, and therefore, um, the currency beginning to yo-yo and balance of payment issues, uh, which are all contrived as urgent and you have to find means of trying to block block up. Um, so we are now uh, in, a, in a state um, where, yes, uh, food, fuel, fertilizer, and financing, um, low financing uh, is problematic, and that is what we have to really um, guard against. How do we move forward, and, and what changes do we have to make? You look, as uh, Vera mentioned, um, the, the DSSI and the common framework, and now the RST, uh, which is new money. Um, but the design of these um, have not yielded a response from African countries to participate because of um, unintended consequences that come with that. So the issue of having a voice uh, in the design is going to be very important. The issue of maybe the G20 plus one and AU voice on there is going to be very important. Uh, and how then to also look at our um, uh, AFDBs and APRI exams um, so that they have the resources needed since they are closer, quote unquote, to the client, will be more nimble, will be more culturally attuned I think we are the only continent where the World Bank provides more resources than the multi multilateral development uh, agency, and I think that cannot continue to be. So those are some of the um, areas that we'll need to um, discuss and make sure appropriate changes uh, come to bear. Thank you, um, Honorable Minister. Um, you know, some of the things you said are very striking. The, the fact that fiscal deficit in Ghana just kind of expanded from, you said, around 5% to around 11%. Uh, but the good thing is the, the economy is actually rebounding, which is good, uh, at least before this uh, war in uh, Ukraine. Um, you, you asked a very important question, how do we move forward? Uh, you know, how do we ensure that the global response uh, supports African countries and indeed other countries around the world that are um, that are maybe struggling or that need that support. But I also wanted to follow up on some of the domestic initiatives going on in Ghana right now. Uh, one that has kind of made the headlines is the e-levy <laughs> um, <laughs> law bill that was passed recently. Uh, we got the news all the way here in Washington, D.C. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, I know that, uh, of course, it received a lot of attention, um, uh, and uh, there were also spending cuts that uh, you announced, including, I think, a 20% reduction in total allocations to ministries, departments, and agencies, uh, all of these to help bolster the fiscal position. So the question is, given that the e-levy passed at a somewhat lower rate than was initially intended, I think around 1.7% or so, do you still expect that the increased revenues generated with these reductions or cuts that have been made will allow you to reach this target of bridging that fiscal deficit? So a question on the e-levy bill. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it was. We have, um, 
I don't, we don't like to call it a hung parliament. We have a balanced parliament. <laughs> and um, it leads to uh, some difficulties in passing bills. Um, so we announced what we read the budget in November 17th and um, March 29th um, this year was when we got, we had passed the appropriation. So you'd imagine appropriation comes with revenue, uh, but somehow the revenue measures were not passed. And, um, and it was quite a big fight uh, until March 29th that um, we got that um, done. And March 29th was quite a significant day and for us, um, it was the president's birthday, and then we got the e-levy passed, which was good, and that was also the day that Nigeria gave us a gift, so we remember it <laughs> very, very fondly, <laughs> that's e-levy day. Um, but essentially, you know, we, we'd seen um, uh, Momo money ma uh, transactions Move from 78 billion in 2016 um, to CDs um, to almost a trillion um, CDs in um, 2021 uh, and December. And um, you know, the realization that e commerce, new tax handles uh, had to be um, uh, brought into the ambit of, 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 of taxation. And, and there were two things we wanted to achieve. One, uh, broadening the net um, so that everybody uh, would pay um, something. And then two, taking advantage of a new tax measure. So the accusation was that it was totally regressive and it was hitting the poor people. But analysis indicated um, that 40% of the people did not um, really and transfer more than 100 CDs. So we exempted that um, from that. So that argument about being regressive is not quite true. Um, and, um, but I think opposition realization was that this was going to open up an envelope for development that will not inure to their benefit. Uh, and so um, that became the political football and you need the numbers in parliament to be able to do that. Eventually, it got passed and um, we lost, we've lost, I guess, five months of income. Um, but I think we'll be able to, um, to, to make it up. And um, the, the need um, for African countries really to, to digitalize and take advantage of that space um, because that's where the economy is going. People are doing transactions from their bedrooms no taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And it offers an opportunity to bring everybody into the net. But I think more significantly also is the issue of democracy. Uh, because once you begin to pay, I think you begin to care about protecting the public purse. And that's really crucial uh, going forward um, as a nation in trans transition and transformation. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to come to Dr. Songwe in a bit, but before then, I wanted to follow up with um, uh, Honorable um, uh, Shamsuna Ahmed. Um, Nigeria unveiled a national development plan uh, to cover the period 2021 to 2025, and it seeks to accelerate growth and foster sustainable development over this period. It also has a huge investment plan. <laughs> size of about $900 billion or so, uh, and of which I think the private sector is meant to account for uh, a significant portion of that. So my question is, how does the, how does the government, uh, your government, aim to coordinate these investments, especially from the private sector, but also following up on your point about subsidies, I know as you said, there was this whole plan of uh, moving away or phasing out the subsidies and this plan was disrupted by these external shocks. Uh, but how, what is the future of fuel subsidies in Nigeria, given how much burden, fiscal burden they are to the country? Thank you very much, Senor. Um, 
Let me just start from the back end. On, on the four subsidies, like I mentioned earlier on, is a huge fiscal burden for us and is deepening our deficit. But it's also going to go away within a short period of time. We had planned to exit by July, like I said earlier on, but we had to extend it by another 12 to 18 months. The parliament is still to pass our request. I don't know how many months it will, it will land at. But we also have uh, in country now one of the largest refineries in the world is being built by the Dangote, the Dangote refinery, 650 million uh, thousand barrels per day refinery. Once that, that refinery is scheduled to be completed by the end of 2022, and it will mean that we'll be able to buy refined products locally. So we will not need to import, and therefore we can very easily remove the subsidy. So that's, that's our, our, our target on subsidy removal. In addition to the Dangote refinery, we have four, four national refineries that are also at different levels of rehabilitation. They're all scheduled. The last one is supposed to be completed at end of uh, 2023. So we'll have refined products locally and we don't need to import and therefore be able to remove the, the, the subsidy. On the development plan, a very large plan, a five-year plan, 900 billion US dollars, 85% of that is projected to be funding through private sector activities, through industry, through productive activities. But uh, so given the constrained uh, uh, fiscal space, it was very clear that there was no way government through budgets could implement and uh, fund a realistic uh, plan. So we had to look also do a financial financing plan for the for, for this new national development plan. And we have to find some funding initiatives. And a few of these I'll mention will be, of course, the obvious PPPs, uh, between uh, pa partnerships between private uh, sector and uh, public sector. There's also um, plans to enhance the capacity of the private sector in all major sectors of the Nigerian economy. And this is going to happen through engagement, trying to understand what the sectors need to be able to unlock uh, um, the challenges that they have and increase their capacity to produce to the economy. We are also establishing, we've established a Nigeria Investment and Growth Fund, which is designed to allow for investments in commercially viable projects that will promote growth, enhance local value addition through backward as well as forward linkages, and also create employment opportunities, promote technical as well as uh, innovation and, and learning, and also to promote exports uh, and enhance diversification. Additionally, we have established an infrastructure corporation of Nigeria, we call it the Improco. This is a PPP partnership infrastructure financing entity wholly dedicated to uh, developing critical infrastructure in the Nigerian economy. So as an investor, you can just invest in Improco uh, to be building out infrastructure projects in Nigeria. We've also rolled out a scheme that we call the Road Infrastructure Tax Credit Refurbishment Scheme. This is a scheme that utilizes tax credits for, uh, for development of uh, infrastructure. So we invite investors to select a, a road and build with their own resources and recover their investment through tax credits over a period of time. It's become very popular. We have so many companies that have uptaken roads and there are major roads that are under construction now under this tax credit uh, investment scheme. There are other initiative framework, the establishment of a national credit enhancement framework. And government continues to work towards enhancing the regulatory environment as well as strengthening institutions to make uh, our institutions more user uh, friendly, more investor friendly to enhance business because the development plan is designed to be driven by the activities of the private sector with government being an enabler um, and, and uh, we have to support the private sector to make sure that the, uh, the, the plan is delivered. Wonderful, thank you uh, for that and, and good to hear of these funds and special purpose vehicles that have been launched in Nigeria to help with infrastructure in particular, which the country and indeed the entire sub-region needs. 
but also uh, ways to kind of crowd in uh, uh, private investments. Now I want to uh, take a slightly different tack track and uh, turn to Dr. Songwe. Um, kind of following up on uh, 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 Ken Ofori Atta's uh, question, what can be done? Um, and indeed, we've already spoken about some of the global initiatives that are being done or that we're all advocating for. But I also wanted to ask at a kind of pan-African regional level, what is the UNECA doing uh, to help support African countries? You know, whether it's the countries that are at risk of debt distress or, uh, you know, countries that are struggling with inflation. Uh, inflation is somewhat global, but African countries too are uh, uh, feeling those impacts. Um, No, thank you, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, three things, some of them I had mentioned before, but maybe I'll add. I think one of the things that uh, where uh, Africa stood out very clearly during the COVID crisis was the fact that we were able to come together under the leadership of President Ramaphosa and collectively procure, and that clearly provided availability, but it also reduced our cost. So one of the initiatives that we're doing in a little bit replicating that idea is we're coming together, hopefully in the next uh, week or two, announcing a platform that will pool, uh, procure all fertilizer. So actually, interestingly enough, Africa produces more fertilizer than it needs. So we export fertilizer to Brazil <laughs> and, and, and many other parts of the world, actually, uh, uh, at some point even to Ukraine. But, uh, uh, but there is now a scarcity of fertilizer on the continent, so if we can pool all the producers of fertilizer, put them on the platform, so at least countries have some transparency and, and sort of, you know, uh, 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 discovery of pricing, uh, we can do, uh, we, it will bring down the, the, the need for additional fertilizer at high prices. We're also hoping, working with Afri-Exim Bank, and this is one of the reasons why we hope that Afri-Exim Bank becomes a prescribed holder of SDRs, they've been able to put $4 billion forward that will help, you know, put in place letters of credit so people can, even if they don't have the resources now, procure fertilizer, procure seeds, because yes, we talk about fertilizer, but we also need seeds, and there is a scarcity of seeds in the market. Of course, wheat, uh, we're trying to see how uh, Ngozi was just uh, uh, in the last two days in Brazil, trying to see whether Brazil, as we heard on the news, is willing to release some stocks, whether we can pull, procure again those, those wheat stocks and bring them onto the continent and then distribute them in an efficient way. So those are some of the things we're doing. Essentially, it was an initiative that started with the AFCFT and an AFCFT platform, but we're gonna use that platform now to sort of pull, procure some of these commodities. The other thing that we're doing is doing analysis uh, on, on sort of what, where can we get help? So when we talk about immediate debt relief for the lowest uh, countries on the continent, when COVID-19 hit, the IMF immediately with the CRT issued uh, debt relief. About 252 million people were able to benefit, and it's about 750 million to a billion dollars. That's something we can do today, yesterday, right? Those countries, the Nigers, the Chads, the CARs of the world, immediately get, get uh, sufficient relief to at least be able to see themselves through this. Um, of course, the other thing that we are asking for is an extension of the DSSI, because we're back into a crisis. But one of the things we've learned, and that's our job, is to learn what's working and what's not working so well and how we improve on it. Yes, we did call for a DSSI in 2020, we got it, but the payment period was a sort of a hard stop. And so what countries had was if you had $500 million of relief, one morning you woke up and you had to pay everything the next morning, it didn't really help. So what we are hoping to do is we're asking for an extension of five years for the repayment period so countries actually have the chance to ease it in and now on top of this crisis, we want another DSSI for two years and then an easing in for five years so countries get immediate liquidity. But more importantly, I think as uh, 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 ministers have both said, what we need is quick additional liquidity. We have $60 billion of SDRs that have been pledged. Uh, I think 45 are going to go to the RST, but the RST is not operational tomorrow. The RST is operational in November. So we need to know what is operational today and so some of the things that we're doing is doing this analysis to see how can we make uh, maybe the PIGT operational tomorrow. Uh, but the PIGT needs subsidies. 
And so what is the amount of subsidies in Cantadono community? With 15 billion, the IMF uh, said that the IGT can become alive. So can we ask for the 15 billion to be immediately put in the RST, in the PRGT, and activated? I think those are the kinds of analysis we're looking at. And of course, the uh, uh, debt framework, the, you mentioned it yourself. We need the common framework to become an operational framework. There's three countries that have signed up to it. None of them has been able to close. Uh, Chad, uh, uh, Ethiopia, and Zambia. Because the framework does not work as it is, I think the IMF has said it, the World Bank has said it, everybody's saying it. Hopefully in these meetings we just agree and put up a new framework so that countries in need of debt restructuring can immediately access it. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very uh, exhaustive list, I would say. Now I would like to uh, invite um, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, of the US Department of Commerce, Cam Ms. Camille Richardson, to join us, and also um, the uh, CEO of the One Campaign, um, Ms. Gail Smith, uh, uh, to join us. Um, yes. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> um, I invite you to read their bios, very illustrious, on our uh, website, um, mindful of time. Um, so I want to hand over to uh, Ms. Richardson uh, to hear from her you know, how we can strengthen U.S. engagement with African countries uh, with the purpose of supporting their recovery, but also more broadly really strengthening U.S.-Africa relations on this front. Well, thank you. It is live. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much. It's it's a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. I'd like to thank the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the One Campaign for inviting me to join you today and to speak with all of you. It's been a pleasure to hear from such distinguished speakers as His Excellency Kenneth Oforiata and Her Excellency Zainab Ahmed, and of course the Honorable Dr. Vera Songwe. Very nice to meet you finally. So I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight uh, the significant priority that the Biden-Harris administration and the US Department of Commerce places on our relationships with Ghana, Nigeria, and more broadly with the countries of the African continent. So as we work together to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course it's still ongoing, uh, we recognize that the world is at an inflection point. And we've heard about how countries have had to, had to adapt, how they've had to practice resilience, how they had had to become very creative um, and innovative. And I think that uh, perhaps that is one of the gifts of the pandemic, and I've talked about this before. Um, it, it has required us to find a way through and to discover uh, the, the silver lining. Where are the opportunities here? How can we move forward together? And that's what we're here to talk about. And we realize that we must work together with our African partners uh, to, to advance a shared vision of a better, greener, and healthier future. So you may have heard about the administration's Build Back Better World initiative. So you had Build Back Better within the United States and Build Back Better World outside of the United States, and we like to nickname it B3W because it's easier to say. And that is a direct response to this new reality that we find ourselves in. Uh, B3W is a partnership that is intended to uh, provide better coordination, financing, very important, and technical support options to support infrastructure development that responds to the climate crisis, that I think we're all going through right now, uh, digital and gender divides, also been exposed by the pandemic and highlighted by it, as well as some of the health security challenges uh, that have come up as a result of not just the pandemic, but I think the ensuing Ukrainian crisis that is also a global, global issue, a global challenge. So one of the ways that B3W, the goals of B3W are being addressed in Africa is through Prosper Africa, which you all may have heard of as well. Prosper, for short, is a presidential initiative uh, that is focused on promoting two-way trade and investment between the United States and African markets. 
since its launch two years ago, we are proud to have supported 800 deals with what we call embassy deal teams uh, that have an estimated value of $50 billion. So these are deals that are benefiting both sides, that are creating jobs on both sides, and which are contributing to economic recovery on both sides of the pond. And the Department of Commerce does play a role, plays critical roles in these initiatives, uh, but we also advance the administration's priorities through our own initiatives, um, one of which I am especially proud uh, we've launched uh, during my tenure. I've been in this chair for hard to believe two years now. And uh, we had an initiative that we called Women Empowered Leave Legacies Through Trade and Investment, or WELTI for short. We are in the process of renaming that initiative. So let's just <laughs> call it Women's Economic Empowerment. Uh, but the attention has captured the imagination, I mean, say the initiative has captured the imagination of our Secretary uh, of Commerce, Gina Raimundo, as well as our newly minted Undersecretary for the International Trade Administration, Marissa Lago. She's the first woman to have been appointed to that role. And, and both, both ladies would like to take this initiative and raise it up to a global level. So what was born in Africa uh, is now going to become a, a global initiative uh, to support women's empowerment through trade and investment, uh, and having women you know, recognize um, each other, do business with each other, and get access to information, data, and resources, uh, along with support from male al allies, of course. We recognize that women have a critical role to play uh, in restarting the global economy. And I believe that it was Bloomberg that, that released a report saying that if women were educated at this globally, that the, the, the global economy could grow by $20 trillion which, you know, if we're leaving that on the table, then we really haven't learned anything, right? Uh, so since we launched this initiative in January of 2021 in Kenya, uh, virtually, we had these virtual visits and coffee chats. We featured women entrepreneurs from different uh, countries in Africa that have a connection of business and education, a cultural connection with the United States, uh, talking about how they have overcome various challenge challenges leveraging uh, gov uh, to grow their uh, to grow their businesses. And this has inspired women uh, on, the, on this side to then explore business opportunities. Uh, 2021, it, it, it kind of took on a life of its own. It grew organically. And so we began with what I started calling a March to March sometime last year. And it culminated in a Women's Empowerment Summit uh, in Dubai that had about 50 women from the US and from uh, the region. And it was live streamed to women around the world. So again, we're looking to to really take what was born there to, to inspire women to really get involved um, in restarting the global economy. But beyond these regional and global initiatives, I'd like to highlight the importance that we place on Nigeria and Ghana in particular. Um, at our US missions in both countries, we do have uh, commercial service officers. I am one of these commercial service officers. What is the commercial service? Well, it's the diplomatic arm of the Commerce Department. Did you know that? We had a, a diplomatic service, probably not. Uh, because we're much smaller than the State Department. Um, we only have uh, commercial posts in 11 African countries, and so we're fortunate to have uh, one in Lagos and one in Accra. And so the, pur the, the purpose of having these commercial diplomats is to deepen the connections uh, between the United States and local businesses and to help identify the opportunities for co cooperation on shared commercial uh, priorities. So I in Nigeria, where we, we do have a commercial and investment dialogue that we haven't had since 2020, and I hope we'll get a chance to restart that soon, we do see real opportunities, uh, including in agribusiness, in clean energy, and in women and youth economic empowerment, as aforementioned, in healthcare, and then also in the digital sector. And we're already seeing some progress. So I'll use the digital sector as an example. Uh, in recent months, We've seen U.S. companies open new offices in Nigeria, work to increase the internet connectivity with subsea cables, and open new data centers. In fact, earlier this month, uh, we have a, a slew of domestic offices. I don't know if you knew that the Depart Department of Commerce has over 100 offices across the United States. Uh, we're called U.S. Export Assistance Centers. And so in our office in San Francisco, uh, they worked with our, our, our commercial post in Lagos they also work with the African Diaspora Network, with Flutterwave, and several venture capital firms to host a U.S.-Nigeria startup accelerator. Uh, and there are just a few examples of the impact of U.S.-Nigeria commercial cooperation uh, in public and private sectors. Uh, turning to Ghana, in 2018, we signed a memorandum of understanding with Ghana's Ministry of Finance 
uh, that was focused on commercial operation around Ghana's strategic economic priorities. So we continued to work with Ghana to identify projects in key economic sectors such as digital, clean energy, and financial services. And we're also working to bring US technology and solutions to help Ghana create a, a more efficient, resilient, and globally competitive agribusiness whoops, sector. And we're supporting women and youth employment through initiatives uh, in sectors such as financing. financing. And in fact, in February, it was a very interesting program I participated in virtually. It was the launch of the U.S.-Ghana partnership under the first program. And this, it will bring Ghana one step closer to safe domestic civil nuclear energy production. Uh, it's a great example of cooperation between the United States and Ghana, and it will help to create conditions that will continue to attract and allow businesses to partner and thrive. So thank you for the opportunity to br uh, briefly address you here today. Um, I look forward to the rest of the program, and please don't hesitate to follow up on any of the things that I raised today. And if you want to learn more about us, check us out at trade.gov. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, great to hear from you, uh, Ms. Richardson, and all the um, initiatives from the Department of Commerce, which was really why we wanted to have you here, that typically when we are having a... Um, you know these kinds of uh, uh, engagements. We 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 tend to engage with, you know, some entities of the U.S. government, but not others. So good to hear about all these uh, uh, very interesting uh, initiatives. And I hope uh, our colleagues from Nigeria and Ghana will follow up with some of them. Now I want to invite uh, Miss Gail Smith. <laughs> Okay, whoa. Um, I want to be brief because we're, we're behind on time, but I'm really struck by something in the conversation, which is Vera at the top talked about the amount of liquidity that wealthy countries were able to inject into their economies. We just heard from two countries that were not able to inject that level of liquidity, but described initiatives they took to stabilize their economies during a massive shock that quite frankly are quite impressive. Uh, I will leave the football rivalry aside. Uh, but I think it's really, it's really worth noting that because I think it's very easy, particularly in the city, to be so focused on the harsh impact on Africa to forget about and discount the initiative that's been taken. So my hat's off to both of you. Um, i just like to pull out a few things we heard that I think are worth all of us considering as, as we go forward. Um, I think this notion of regional platforms that Vera described is something that's got huge potential, including as work on the CFTA is done over the coming years. That same kind of regional platform was built for the response to the COVID pandemic and the importation of some of the supplies that were needed. Um, we heard a lot about timing, whether it's the timing that some things are too slow and other things are too fast that on the SDRs we need to see faster delivery, but on the debt service initiative, having a cutoff date that is as soon as the one that's coming isn't realistic given the duration of this shock. And I think third, we heard a lot about flexibility. When we think about the global response, when we think about what this country and others may do, one of my takeaways is flexibility. There's a tendency to create plans, initiatives, and ideas and then stick to the script uh, and given the volatility we've seen in economies, I think that flexibility is key. More important, I think, are three messages about what those of us uh, who live and work in cities like this need to be mindful of. I want to underscore something that the Honorable Minister from Ghana, I'm so bad at formality, I'm just inclined to call him Ken, uh, said which was about access to capital markets. That is something we've got to keep an eye on throughout the ongoing tremors created by the pandemic and those created by the Russian invasion of Ukraine or anything else, climate change, whatever else it may be. Because when that starts to falter, we start to have even deeper systemic problems. So I think that's one thing to keep an eye on. The second is who's at the table. 
Um, it's great that the new mechanism has been set up for the transfer of SDRs. My experience, <coughs> I will quote one of my colleagues on the one team in Nigeria, she said, uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. It's pretty harsh, but it's a pretty good line, right? Uh, and I think in the design of these mechanisms that are designed in theory in partnership, then that design has to reflect the reality of everybody who's going to be impacted by it. And the more we can do to have it be co-designed from the ground floor, rather than designed with the best of intentions and then presented. That's key in almost everything we do. The third is to be very aware of something that Vera mentioned, which is what she called dynamic divergence. Um, this is something we're seeing escalate, where rich and poor within countries, between countries, and between regions. What that risks in terms of a global economy is that we will see some who are able to move to the kind of digitization that, that Ken spoke about and some that aren't, some that are able to green their economies and move into a more climate realistic, friendly, and smart strategy and those that aren't. That's a danger for everybody, so we gotta keep an eye on that. And how do we do that? I will close with answering the question about, okay, so what does this mean for countries like the U.S. I'm somebody who's been in and out of government. I'm, I, people talk about the revolving door in terms of lobbying. My revolving door is from advocacy to government to advocacy. And I think what I would like to see, having served, but also now being once again an advocate, uh, is that even as we focus on the harsh impacts of a pandemic, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we also bear in mind the need to flip that on its head and recognize that at a time when the world looks to be reorganizing itself in some yet undefined ways, that this is the moment when we need to start thinking about Africa more strategically in terms of it being an economic partner in the most strategic and long-term sense. Because I am one who believes that despite the shocks we've seen, it is going to prove to be one of the most vibrant components of the global economy over time, and we'd be smart to get with the program as soon as possible. I will end it there and pass it back to you. Great. We're, we are playing a game of uh, pass the microphone here. <laughs> Um, but um, I think you, you said uh, things that are very powerful, that it's time to think about Africa in a more strategic manner, certainly here in the U.S., in other global capitals. And then, of course, the other things you mentioned about access to capital markets, inclusion at the table of decision-making for African countries, um, and also this concept of dynamic divergence, kind of echoing uh, what uh, Vera said. Um, so we have just a few minutes to go. We're already uh, way <laughs> behind schedule. Um, but I would like to take the opportunity to get a couple of questions, even if we don't address all of them. So I'm telling you right now, we might not address all of them. But I want to give you the opportunity to ask them. And there are a couple that we've received online. So I know we have people very eager here in the audience. But I'm going to start from the online questions. And then we'll come over to you. So let me read the, f the one question we've received, and I'm going to read one from here. Uh, and it's a question for the Honorable Minister of Finance from Nigeria. The person is asking, what are the specific policy reforms being undertaken to attract investments from foreign investors? So f to attract foreign investments, given the many uh, challenges of doing business in Nigeria. So that's question one. We'll take a couple from our in-person audience. Um, are, there, are there microphones? Everybody okay. should have a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, my name is Amaka, and I run the Africa practice at Eurasia Group. My question is for the Honorable Minister from Nigeria. Um, what has been clear in this conversation is just how important it is to have revenue, right? Whether it's to stimulate the economy or to protect the vulnerable. 
Um, that's something that Africa traditionally has been behind the curve in, right? Revenue to GDP ratios are about 15% compared to 30% in OECD countries. In Nigeria, it's 6% for the, the central government. My question is, what is, I'm sorry, the, 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 there is, I think, as a legacy of military rule in Nigeria, there's a bit of a consensus against paying taxes that we're, that we're struggling with. This is something that I know that you have been talking about a lot, but not a lot of other people have been talking about it. What would be your advice to the next president in terms of how we change, how we drive a cultural shift in attitudes towards paying taxes, starting from Nigeria's elite. What specific advice might, would you give him, having worked on this this year? Thank you. I know, I knew you were going to come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Lily Odano. I lead the Africa Energy and Climate Innovation Program at Clean Air Task Force. So my question is, it could actually be answered by any of the ministers, but I think I would want to hear from the minister from Ghana because that's my home country. Um, I uh, thank you for sharing your, your thoughts about and what you did um, to handle the COVID pandemic. What I wanted to hear a bit more about is the role of research and innovation in those post-pandemic plans because when the crisis hits, I think one of the biggest fears across the world was how Africa was going to respond. And we were behind in terms of being part of vaccine manufacturing, even the manufacture of PPEs at a point. And so I think that research and development, it's a core part of our response. And I would want to know what, what you have in mind um, in that area. I know that currently in Africa, we, we have less than 1% of our GDP going to that, even though we are accounting for 14% of the global population. So what's, what's the role of research and development in, in the post-pandemic recovery plan? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carl Levan. I'm from American University. Um, mostly I work on Nigeria, democracy and development. Right now I'm working on uh, the impact of COVID on uh, political trust, working with scholars from three different continents. Um, my question um, brings together uh, the issues of finance and economic planning raised today with diplomacy. Um, and that is uh, several of the speakers today outlined the devastating impact of the war in Ukraine on African economies. And I really appreciate how you laid out the ripple effects but uh, when the United Nations voted um, uh, on the principle of sovereignty, uh, 17 out of 35 abstentions on the resolution condemning Russia's invasion were from Africa. Um, and that was a surprise to many foreign policy observers given the uh, principle of the sacrosanct principle of sovereignty um, in Africa that uh, arose in the nationalist movements and was embraced by the Africa Union in the 1960s. So, what a, can you tell us something about the dialogues between your economic ministries and the foreign affairs ministries? Thank you, Carl. Unfortunately, those are all the questions. Unfortunately, those are all the questions we can take because the ministers have to leave. As you can see, some of our other speakers have already left. I'm very, very sorry. You know, it's the World Bank, IMF, uh, spring meetings. Uh, we're even very lucky to have them here today. So please accept my apologies. Um, so we have four questions so far, one on attracting FDI in Nigeria, and then another one on anti-tax bias in Nigeria. Then for Ghana, w what are plans for research and innovation and development? And then uh, a question for, for uh, the two honorable ministers on to explain the UN vote on Ukraine. I don't know if they can really explain that, but I'm sure they will attempt to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Carl, I'm not going to venture into that, <laughs> if you don't mind. So, um, let me just say that um, in my earlier presentation, I had given examples of some of the things we've done in terms of attracting, uh, uh, sourcing different uh, financing for the our new national development plan. So it includes PPPs, it includes setting up Infraco, which is an investment vehicle. So as a diaspora, you can actually invest in that company for the development of infrastructure. We have the tax credit scheme. We also have 
other schemes that are work in progress. There's also the Special Nigeria Wealth Investment Fund. We tried to create these vehicles to make it easy for uh, FDIs to invest into a specific vehicles. But of course, we would prefer that you come into Nigeria, set up a business, and actually run your business. But not everybody wants to do that. People want to invest maybe in something that is already structured and, and, and run. So that's, that's part of the things we did. But then it's also work in progress. Amaka um, was asking how, what we're doing to create uh, more revenue. I have spent six years of my life as a minister preoccupied by, by creation of revenue. And, and we've m we have actually made very significant progress. We started by developing an initiative that we call the Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative, which identified a number of programs and projects that we must implement and were rigorously implementing. And one of them is that we needed to do something basic like returning our budget circle to a predictable January to December. We needed, and we've done that. And we needed to also have finance bills accompanying our annual budgets. The finance bills have proven to be very, very important in terms of unlocking revenue. Because the block uh, were able to amend laws that were allowing leakages and also increase taxes. In some case, we actually reduced taxes during the pandemic using the instrument of the Finance Act. And we have the electronic levy that was implement, have been implemented for over seven years in the country, but we now legislated it, so it's backed by, by law. We did a new law for digit that taxing the digital economy. That is the transactions of the Facebook and the, and the Amazons, all of those big uh, digital corporates that are operating in Nigeria, but Nigeria is not seeing any revenue uh, from that. So we've seen our revenue was 6.1 trillion. The good story about that is 80% of our revenue is now from the non-oil sector. When we started out, it was the other way around. Now it's from the non-oil sector. These are investments that used to uh, remit little or nothing in terms of dividends to government, but we've been able to reform the activities of this government-owned uh, enterprises through the instruments of the finance bills, and we are seeing incremental revenue. But of course, expenditure is growing much faster than the revenue, so the race is still on. Let me pass to Ken. Yes. Thanks. Hello, is it on? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for the question. We are way behind in R and D, and um, but um, um, the minister of um, thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we are way behind in R&D. I know it came to cabinet about a percentage of revenues, and that's still being debated. Um, so uh, we, we, need, we need to push forward uh, on that. Um, revenue, revenue, revenues. I think we are about 13% um, revenue to, to GDP, woefully inadequate. We're hoping e-levy and issues like that will be able to bring those up. So everybody will be in the net uh, because we have to do that. Um, so that's good. And then Carl's question. Should I dodge it too? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a politician. You're in the parliament, aren't you? No, I'm not in the parliament. <laughs> no, but, but it's interesting. I mean, uh, we're on the Security Council, so you know how we voted. But the question, uh, I guess, you know, not being judgmental on what anybody voted, if the EU itself decides to pay $300 million a day to Russia to get their supplies, then why should an India or South Africa, so who takes the log out of their eye before looking at the spec? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you, you are right there next door, and you are saying, I'll give you $300 million a day for your machinery to fight. And then there's a new word called what? Friendly onshoring or something? <laughs> so I, I don't know, Carl. I mean, <laughs> the guy who is going to be beaten up is paying. And then you are far away wondering how you get your oil and fertilizer. I don't know. I, I, it, 
becomes very difficult for judgment, whether it's absolute or whether it's relative, and what is the moral threshold? Is it a million um, Ukrainians dying before NATO will move? Or is it a NATO person dying before then you'll move? So you sit back and um, every country, I guess, makes their decision. <laughs> so that, that's the question for you, you know? <laughs> And I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're way behind time. And uh, I know our honorable ministers have to leave for other engagements. I would like to take the opportunity to thank them for honoring our invitation, for engaging in this very important discussion, I would say. Uh, very, you know, very insightful. And also for uh, the rest of our guests who unfortunately had to leave for other engagements. And of course, I would like to thank our audiences who are able to brave the odds, the pandemic, the weather, everything, uh, to join us here in person, as well as those who joined us uh, virtually. And then finally, I would like to thank our organizing teams, uh, the Carnegie Endowment, uh, the Africa Program, uh, the organization more broadly, but also our partners at the One Campaign for this uh, very important event. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank <laughs> you.